Listen, we're going to jump right into the word, but I just want to kind of give you a warning about what's getting ready to happen. Um, today, we're going to do some surgery, okay? Um, it's going to be quiet. I already know that. Uh, it's going to be a surgery day today, something the Lord shared with me, and uh, I'm, I'm really believing this is going to be a game changer for you. And um, I want you to go with me to the book of Joshua chapter 1, and we're going to read verses 1 and 2 in your hearing. And, uh, and we're going to let the Lord lead us and guide us through this particular message. And I pray, I really do pray that you leave here today saying, man, like God spoke to me today. Joshua chapter 1, beginning at verse 1, says this, After the death of Moses, the servant of the Lord, the Lord said to Joshua, son of Nun, Moses' aid, Moses, my servant, is dead. Now then, you... And all these people get ready to cross the Jordan River into the land I'm about to give them to the Israelites. Do me a favor, repeat my subject to your neighbor. It's going to be a little awkward. But I want you to look at your neighbor and repeat my subject and say, neighbor, it's okay to cry. Now, don't start crying yet. I'm just saying it's okay. It's okay to cry. The book of Joshua is actually one of my favorite books of the Bible. Um, if you've read anything in the Old Testament, you see where God speaks to Abraham and tells him that he's going to give him a land flowing with milk and honey and that his descendants will actually live on that land. That promise is passed from Abraham to Isaac, then Isaac to Jacob, Jacob to the 12 tribes, and to eventually they're in Egypt. Uh, God raises up Moses. Moses then speaks to Pharaoh. They're delivered from Egyptian bondage. They go to the wilderness, and now we're eventually getting to the promised land. And this promise that God has made to Joshua and to the children of Israel is getting ready to come to pass. The thing that's interesting, though, about this text that I want to slow down and really point out and highlight is this, that in order for us to really see God move in our lives, we have to make sure that we don't always rush over things while we're reading the Bible. Sometimes we really need to really sit down and look at it word by word and say, wow, I didn't see that before. And so when I was looking at Joshua chapter 1, uh, verses 1 and 2, it, it kind of dawned on me when he said, Moses, my servant is dead. I began to think about Joshua. And I said, wow, I wonder how Joshua felt when he got the news that Moses was dead. Because you have to understand the relationship between Moses and Joshua. Joshua was like, I believe, like a, uh, like a son in a sense. Like it was like a father-son relationship. Moses was definitely his pastor. Joshua served as his assistant. When Moses went to, the, went to the mountain to talk to God and he got the commandments, Joshua was there. When he came down and broke the commandments, Joshua was there. When they heard noise going in the camp, when they were building the golden calf, Joshua was there. When Moses was at his highest point and his lowest point, Joshua was present. And so Joshua had a relationship with Moses, unlike a lot of the other people in the camp and of the children of Israel. And so this, was, this relationship was very, very close. And so now I'm your successor, and it's okay. I know you're not going into the promised land, but now I have to deal with the reality and I've gotten the news that now you're dead. How did Joshua feel when he received the news that his mentor, his leader, his father figure, his pastor was no longer living? In Deuteronomy 34 and 8, it says this. It says, the Israelites grieved for Moses in the plains of Moab 30 days. Somebody say 30 days until the time of weeping and mourning was over. What we see in this is a grieving process. If you're taking notes, I want you to write down this, it's okay to grieve. It's okay to grieve. Grieving is a natural process to loss. However, the grieving process has a broader reach than just the loss of a loved one. Please hear me this morning. Grief can be connected to a traumatic event that happened to you in your life. Grief can be connected to a divorce. Grief can be connected to not having the life you wanted but never received. 
Grief can be connected to a dream that never came to pass. Grief can be connected to a goal you never reached. Grief is connected with loss no matter what the loss is. And so the children of Israel are weeping and mourning 30 days. And the question I have for you is, what time did you give yourself to process what happened? Because what we are failing to realize is that grief is bigger than just losing a loved one. It's much broader than that. And so some of us, we don't realize that we're walking around toxic because we never grieved. We've never given our time, ourselves time to actually get it out of our system. And so what do you do when you're trying to move on and do what you're supposed to do when you haven't given yourself time to grieve? The danger that happens when we experience the loss is we become so busy in handling business that we forget about pouring or actually handling our emotions properly. So we suppress our emotions and force them to operate from a numb place. And so now you've experienced it, it has happened, but now you're walking around and you're not feeling anything because you've never given yourself time to grieve. It could be connected to a relationship that you had that's no longer there, the breakup. Have you grieved the breakup? Did you give yourself time to get it out your system? Did you give yourself time to think through everything that you need to think through? Did you give your emotions the liberty to get on the roller coaster? Because what we fail to realize is that grieving is, pro is, is actually natural. When you're grieving, you have moments where you are crying and you hit a low and then things get okay, and you say, you know what, I remember when, and then you go up and you have a high, and then you get numb, and then it turns, and then you have another bad moment, and then you go down, and then you go up, and then you have another turn, and you go a loop, and, it's, and so what we do is we try to medicate that kind of problem, right? And so we try to tell people, listen to me, you've been thinking about that long enough. When reality is we have to give people time to process the loss. And so when you lost your job, did you give yourself time to grieve the loss of your job before you moved on to the next one? Because if you've been there for 20 years, 25 years, and they let you go, you don't leave there going, oh, thank you for the opportunity. I look forward to the next one. You're going, what do you, wait a minute, I gave you 25 years of my life. What do you mean this is over? Now you are angry. And so sometimes you can be happy and angry and sad and have bouts of depression all in a matter of an hour. Because your emotions are all over the place. But what happens is we become super spiritual. And so we become insensitive to people's needs and we don't give them time to process the loss. It's okay to grieve. Sometimes we have to because that's the way we operate in our new season in a healthy way. Ignoring this process can be dangerous to the growth of the individual. So the Bible, now look at this, point number two, it is unwise not to grieve. There is something psychologists call incomplete grief. It means that you started the process, but you didn't finish it. And when someone is going through incomplete grief, things like this start to happen. They have continued obsessions. In other words, Obsessing over what happened and why and the feelings uh, of sadness and loss are a part of the normal process of grief. But sometimes a person will get stuck on an emotional rewind and can't move forward. And so they find themselves replaying the moments of grief or cry whenever the person or the thing is mentioned. So you're moving and then something happens and you press the rewind button and you go back. You make some steps, something happens, you press the rewind button and you keep going back. You keep reliving the same emotion over and over. And when you are in incomplete grief, you find yourself on a treadmill. Even though you're making, you have emotion, you're not getting ahead. 
And so a lot of people, especially in our community, what we do is we like to suppress it. When I was coming up, most of the boys can, uh, and God, excuse me, men can recognize this, is that when you were coming up, you was wrestling with your boys or you was playing football or basketball or doing something, and you fell, the one thing you were not supposed to do was cry. No, 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 bro. Suck it up. Suck it up. You hurt? Nah, bro. I'm good. I'm good. I'm good. You know it hurt. You want to cry, but you will not dare let a tear fall from your eye because men don't cry. And brothers, that's our problem. We have no release. And you're suppressing all of your emotions. And when you don't properly grieve something, you suppress it and you keep reliving things to the point that you start having behavioral over overreaction. You are responding way wrong. Like somebody brought up the name and you just went off. And everybody was like, hold on. Like, what happened? We just mentioned this and you just went off. You know why? You didn't properly grieve. You begin to self self harming behaviors where you now become addicted to drugs. So now, and, and I'm not even talking about uh, illegal drugs. Some people medicate their pain through prescription drugs. So you take a pill to go to sleep, then you take a pill to get energy, then you take a pill to stay awake, then you take another pill not to be depressed, then you take another pill to be happy, then take another pill to go back to sleep. And so now you're hooked on medication because you can't get your emotions together. So now you medicate your way through life and you never deal with the issue because you never properly grieved. You become numb and depressed because you didn't grieve, now you become, you become irritable. But really, you're irritable because you're angry. And can I tell you, so let me help y'all something. Somebody told you never to get mad with God, and they didn't. They meant well, but they didn't tell you right. God is omniscient. You think God tripping in heaven because you mad at him? Do you think... He's surprised by your anger. If he knows it, he knew it was coming. Here's the thing. God says, I'll let you be mad at me. I'll, I'll, I'll let you be mad, but you can't stay mad. So while you're still mad at me, I'm still waking you up in the morning. I'm going to still provide for you. I'm going to still rain blessings in your life. I'm still going to do what I'm supposed to do because your anger to me don't change me and it doesn't change what I do. God understands because when you, don't ha when you have questions, there are only some questions only God can answer. And when you get mad at God, he says, no problem, I'll give you time so I can eventually talk and speak to that situation. So when you say, God, I'm mad, he's like, I hear you, let's talk. He's not offended by your anger. I'll tell you this. I, I don't think my mother would mind. I didn't get permission, but I don't, I don't think she would mind. Um, what, what happened was my mother and my father uh, wanted to have another baby, and so they tried, and my mom was pregnant with my brother Matthew. Um, but he didn't make it. Uh, he was born stillbirth. And so my mom... My mom didn't understand. Wait a minute. We love God. We go to church. My father was pastoring at the time, I believe. Um, he's like my dad's is definitely preaching. My dad's preaching. He, he's he's going different places. He's loving God. He's living by the word. She's living by the word. They're doing everything they're supposed to do. And then I lose my baby. God, I'm mad. How in the world I'm tithing, I'm serving, I'm singing on the choir, I'm going to revivals, I'm going to church, I'm giving you praise. And the preacher said, if I praise him, it'll all turn around. If I praise him and run around the church, that it'll change. He told me if I gave five people high five, that grace will be extended to that. If I turned around seven times and seven is the number of completion, that by the time I turned around the seventh time, God was going to turn it around and God seemed to do a rewind on me I'm mad because what I thought you said you didn't do and God I'm mad but what happens is when she lost the baby she went through a season of saying God I don't know if I believe you the way I used to because you didn't answer my prayer the way I thought you were answering and I came to tell somebody it's okay to have that feeling because God knows because it's normal but you can't stay mad because when you stay mad you become bitter We become bitter over things we should let go. And so what happened a year later, I pop up. 
And the reason I said that is because sometimes God may be trying to give you something different. Maybe he's trying to give you an experience and a ministry through the misery that you've experienced. And he can trust you with the fact that you can take the loss and keep ticking. That you can take the L and keep moving. That you can go through divorce and bounce back. That you can lose your loved one and still keep a smile on your face. Not that you weren't angry. Not that you didn't have bouts of repression. Not because you wasn't on the emo- emotional roller coaster. But the fact that he knew you could, you could actually handle the ride. So the Bible says, after the death of Moses, the Lord says to Joshua, son of Nun, he says, Moses is dead. The first thing that happens when you get traumatic news is shock and denial. What just happened? What are you saying to me? What? Let me have a seat. That's why normally when you got to give somebody bad news, the first thing you ask them is, what are you doing? Where are you? And if they're standing up, you might want to tell them to have a seat. And if they're driving, you want to tell them to park the car. Because the information can be so much that it could shock their system that they will literally black out of where they are and cause harm to themselves. And so shock is, comes as a result of that. So when you're shocked, you have to take a minute to process and you're unclear and you've got to figure things out. But even though you are shocked, it's okay because now you have to deal with the disbelief of, is this really happening? Right. No, nah, you, you can't be saying what I think you're saying. No, that, no, no, that can't be true. I just talked to them. It, that, that can't be right. I just left the meeting. They said this. Now they're doing this. No, I just left the school. My kid was fine. What you mean that they just had a seizure? What, what, what do you mean? I just, did, now you're in denial trying to figure things out because this is natural. This is a part of the process of grieving. So when we deal with shock, then the next thing we deal with this, pain and guilt. Because now you got to feel the pain of the loss because now reality has set in. I know somebody in scripture who can answer this question very clearly. You know him. His name is Jesus. In John chapter 11, Jesus has a friend by the name of Lazarus. Lazarus gets sick. The sisters call Jesus on the phone. Hey, Jesus, hey, um, just to let you know, Lazarus isn't feeling well. Say he wanted to see you. It'd be cool if you swing by the house. Jesus doesn't come by. Situation uh, ends up getting worse. They have to submit him to the hospital. And when he gets to the hospital, hey, Jesus, just so you know, Lazarus has been submitted to the hospital. Uh, he's in room 612. Jesus does not come. He's then, uh, uh, his condition gets worse, and they put him in the ICU. So now he's in intensive care, and He's plugged up to all kinds of machines and it's not looking well and they send Jesus a text and they're blowing his phone up and he does not respond. Lazarus dies. They call Levy's <laughs> or Myers from her home. Uh, they call one of them. Uh, they make out the arrangements. Um, they get it. They have the funeral. Jesus, a friend, doesn't even show up to the home going service. He doesn't even give words. He's on the program to give three minutes <laughs> in the remarks. Jesus doesn't even show. They had the grace out service, dust to dust, ashes to ashes, all that. Where's Jesus? Nowhere to be found. The Bible says that Jesus shows up four days later, and when his sisters see Jesus coming, they said this, if you would have been here, my brother wouldn't have died. Now, I know some of y'all think these girls was like, well, dear rabbi, if you were here, my brother would have, would have still been living if you were present. No, nah, if you would have been here, this wouldn't have happened. We know you are able to perform miracles. We know you have the power to do anything but fail. And you failed us and you didn't show up. You don't think them girls angry? You don't think they mad at Jesus? Yeah, I love you, but you're wrong. You didn't even come to the funeral. 
They mad. But let me tell you what happens. The divinity side of Jesus, because John deals with the divinity of Christ, when the disciple says, hey, Jesus, you want to check out Lazarus? He's really sick. Jesus says in his divinity, Lazarus is dead, and I'm glad. But he goes on to say, because God is going to get glory out of that. That's the divine side of Jesus. The human side of Jesus picks up in verse 34 when the Bible says, and when he had, and where, he says, where have you laid him? He asked, come and see, my Lord. They replied, verse 35, shortest Bible verse in the Bible, Jesus wept. Why did he cry? Over the friend that he lost. This text shows us that Jesus had to grieve. Jesus had to go through a natural process of losing something that was close to him. And some of you in the room, you're like, I'm good, I'm good, I'm good. I don't have to worry about it. I'm moving on. I'm good. Nobody, you ain't got to call on me. You ain't got to check on me. I'm fine. And you're not. You need to find some place to cry to get this out of your system because you can't handle this properly if you don't grieve. Then what happens if you don't properly grieve, the pain will turn into guilt. Then you start saying stuff like, maybe I should have did this. Maybe I should have said that. Maybe if I didn't say that, we would still be together and we wouldn't be divorced. Maybe if I didn't make that move, maybe we could have worked this out some kind of way. Maybe if I would have had this line in the contract, I would still be in business. Or if I would have visited more, I would have been in a different place. And now you're living in guilt because you allowed the pain to sit there too long. You look at your neighbor and say, it's not your fault. You got to get it out. You got to understand, you have to get this stuff out. And so we deal with pain and guilt. Let me explain something to you. A few years ago, I was living uh, in Detroit, and I, I shared our testimony with you all when, you know, we lost, we had lost everything. We lost our home, and um, had to start all over again. And at one point, right before we hit, like, rock, rock bottom, um, I remember I was uh, leaving a particular place, and um, anybody who knows anything about Detroit, I could actually take Gratiot, um, uh, and to get where I wanted to. In other words, if I want to go to downtown Columbia, I take 277, right? I was so mad. What I did is I got on 77 and drove all the way around, right? So I got on 94, Interstate 94, and I drove all the way around. And I was in so much pain, so frustrated, so mad, so just bitter with everything that was going on. I put all the windows down in the car. And I screamed. I mean, I screamed because I had nothing else to do, I didn't know what else to do besides get it out. And so I screamed, I'm, ah! and if anybody would have been driving past, they would have thought I've lost it, and I did. I had enough sense to keep the car in the lane, but I had to get whatever's in my heart out of me because it was so much in me. And some of you are praying and fasting your way into a safe. Because some of you that, oh, if I fast and pray about it, it's all going to change. And be, depending on your wiring, you are fasting and praying yourself in a safe, and you're not letting you, you deal with your true emotions, and that's why you saved and bitter. That's why you, oh, that's why you can worship God and mean. That's why you... Y'all ain't going to talk to me. This is why you all this and something else, too, because you haven't processed your true emotions. So let's look at this. The Bible says that God speaks to Joshua. He says, Moses is dead. Now then, get all the people and now cross over Jordan because now it's time for you to move forward. There is a difference, my friends, between moving forward and moving on. And some of us think we're moving on. This is why you could be in one situation and you're bleeding in the last thing. The reason why the children of Israel had to grieve Moses is because if they didn't grieve the death of Moses, they would have been putting Moses on Joshua. In other words, you'll leave one place and you're putting the old place on the new place. That, I'm trying to be generic and be more specific. You could be on a new date thinking about your old date. You could be in a new marriage thinking about your last marriage. Ooh, it's got quiet. You could be in a new church thinking about your old church. Right? So, so, so what happens is we have to grieve this thing and we can't move on. You can move on, but it doesn't mean you're moving forward. 
He says, I need you to move forward. I want you to move in a healthy capacity. Lead the children of Israel, but you can't lead them forward if you didn't grieve properly. Oh, come on. I want you to think about that relationship you had that's over and that person's still living. Because y'all had an argument and a fallout, and it's like, it's over. It'll never be the same. Some people are afraid to leave because they're afraid of what everybody else is going to say. The reality is, you have to grieve that, and you got to get that out your system. You think it's something else. I came to tell you this morning, it's grieving. Oh, man, pastor, I got church hurt. No, you're grieving. And if you don't grieve, you'll let the hurt from the church or that particular person who hurt you at that church to sit into your heart and you become bitter and you can't move forward, but you will move on. So you will find yourself in a new place still operating from the bitterness from the last place. And the bitterness that gets into the new place doesn't allow you to do what you could do because everybody sees the bitterness but you. Maybe you need to sit down. Oh, no, no, I want to be active. No, you need to sit down. No, maybe, no I'm, I'm going to get my hands. I'm ready to do whatever I need to do. Do you realize that you're bleeding? No, 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 I'm not bleeding. I'm just going to put a bandage on it. See, I'm good. Let's go. No, you need stitches. But if we're in denial... If we're in denial of what is really going on, we'll never change. I was having a conversation uh, uh, between the services, and we were talking about the fact of how do you know when you, you need to grieve? Sometimes we didn't even realize that, the, that what was missing was the grieving process. We didn't give ourselves time to deal with it. Pastor, I thought I would have, I thought I would have children by this time, and I thought I'd be married, and I thought my life would be this way, and uh, the way it's looking is that that's not going to happen. I don't know what I'm going to do. Then what you prayed for, somebody else gets. Now, there's jealousy and envy coming up in your heart towards them because you didn't properly grieve the loss of your dreams not coming to pass. Oh, I, I thought I would have children. And the doctor says, you can't. Now you have to grieve your dream. I, 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 just, I just knew this opportunity was going to work out, but it didn't. You got to grieve that. You have to come to realize, that's not happening. Okay, so what do I do now? I gotta have the shock of it's not happening. I gotta go through the emotions and the sadness and the roller coaster of it's gonna be okay, but I'm mad that it's not happening. I gotta go through all that. If I automatically go to, I'm good. You move on. And everything that's happening is like pressure in a pressure cooker. And eventually, something has to pop. And this is what we call a breakdown. Because you never grieved. Oh, I, I got too much to do. No, 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 no. We want you to move forward. God has great things for you, but he wants you to move forward. But I, this thing hit me this weekend, and I said, you know what? There's so many people who are coming to church that you've never grieved. Please hear what I'm saying. Your father wasn't there. You're angry and you're mad because he was absent. Did you ever grieve the fact that you were going to be fatherless? Did, did you ever grieve the fact that, you know what, I thought that my life would be this way? Did you ever grieve the fact that somebody abused you and now you're dealing with it and now you have to leave and you have to deal with the scars of what happened? you got to grieve all of that. 
I never thought I would get married, have this big old wedding, have uh, bridesmaids and groomsmen, and walk down the aisle and have all this stuff and spend all this money on a, on a, a, a reception and, and limos and horses and carriages and videographers and photographers to find out three years later I'm filing paperwork? And everybody thought this was a match made in heaven. And when I got home, I realized it was a contract made in hell. And I lived through hell, and everybody else thought it was wonderful. And I'm sitting here struggling. What do you do with a teenager who has dreams of becoming, a, 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 of getting a scholarship to play basketball or some sport, and your senior year don't even get, get called or get a letter or, or a commitment letter from any other place to play sports? You don't think that kid has to grieve? Do you see it now? And so when you don't grieve, that's where envy and jealousy and strife and gossip comes from. Because when you've grieved properly, I'm happy you, you're getting it, even though I didn't get it because I've grieved properly. Oh, I'm mad his church bigger than mine. What? And so now, why do we have that? Because we have not properly grieved. I have a question and I'm going to stop. Did you grieve the old you? For the new you. Oh, y'all all right. See, you want God to do something new in you. You have to grieve the old you to embrace the new you. Behold, I'll do a new thing. Y'all hear what I'm saying? Old things are passed away. All things have become new. I'm going to make you a new creation. That new creation means I have to leave something old behind. And to grieve that, sometimes it's hard. I remember a few, a few years ago, I was working, and a friend of mine I went to school with called me. He said, hey, Sim, uh, I need a favor, man. You know, I'm getting ready to take um, the bar exam, but uh, uh, they told me I have to get this particular uh, um, issue off my record. Something happened when I was in school, and, um, and I need you to see if I can come down there, meet with the judges, and I get this expunged off my record because I'm getting ready to take the bar to become an attorney. I'm so excited. I'm ready to take this test, but I got to get this expunged. I said, no problem. I went to a few judges, talked to them to get some direction, tried to give him some counsel on where he needed to go and who he needed to talk to. And I had to call him back, and I said, man, um, I don't have any good news. He said, he said, what do you mean? I said, man, when you got in trouble that day, you got three strikes in that one day. And by South Carolina law, that is not going to come off your record. You mean to tell me I'm not going to become an attorney? Yeah. He got a, the shot. You see it? No, no, you, you lying to me, right? Denial. Are you kidding me? Angry. Why did I do that? Guilt. You, do you see the process? I got to deal with all of that. Then the last thing I got to do is finally say, you know what? I got to accept it. And now I have to chart out a new path. But some of us don't think about life this way. And I came to tell you, that's why you're so salty because you never properly grieved. You know what you can do to cover up your grief and make people think you're the bomb? Work harder. So you become a workaholic not because you really work hard, you're working hard because you don't handle your grief well. So all of this, Moses is dead. But I need you to move forward. I want you today to think about the thing you need to grieve properly, and I want you to identify how you need to move forward and not just move on. Because you will find yourself in a lot of activity and not getting any progress, not getting any better, and it'll be 15 years from now and you'll still be stuck because you never gave yourself the opportunity to grieve. I give you permission today to cry. I give you permission to go home and lock the door and cry your eyes out. 
I give you permission to get in the car and say I need to take a ride and drive and cry until you got it all out your system. I give you, I, I just give you the liberty to do that because you can't walk around all pent up and stressed because you won't grieve that thing. Because God wants you healthy because you'll be in, see, listen, if Israel did not grieve Moses, they would have fought Joshua in their new place. So God knew that. So let me get Moses and let you properly put him where he's supposed to be and you appreciate everything Moses did. We ain't bashing Moses. We ain't mad at Moses. Thankful for Moses. But God has now given us Joshua. Let us appreciate Joshua. But if we never take Moses out the seat, and Joshua's trying to sit in the seat, we always going to fight him from taking the seat. If I was preaching another message, I would talk about when God has to change your head. Because Moses brings them out of Egypt to the promised land, but it is Joshua who takes them in. And it takes a different head. <sighs> Moses had the mind of deliverance. Joshua had the mind of conquering. So when they went into the, uh, to the promised land, it wasn't given to them. They had to fight to get it. Moses wasn't a warrior. Joshua was. So if you fight your Joshua, you'll, you'll be in your new place and you'll never get it because you're not willing to fight because your head wrong. Oh, my God. Are you hearing what I'm saying to you? God wants to take you to the next level in your life to take you to the next. But you can't get the next if you don't grieve.